Hello, today we're going to talk about rules of thumb. So what do I have in mind by this? So we're going to talk about the ideas of uh, using 3D um, and making sure to justify it and even making sure to justify 2D. Also the principle of eyes beat memory, resolution over immersion, the mantra overview first zoom and filter details on demand, the idea of responsiveness, and then finally form and function. All right, let's start. So 3D is an interesting state of affair. People often use it without actually carefully justifying it. That's true not only in data journalism, but a number of other places. Here are two particularly egregious examples. Um, and so the question to ask yourself is, what is going on here? These are either of these a good idea? Um, if they're not a good idea, why? Why are they not a good idea? You know, let's analyze what what is going wrong here. So, you know, here we've got something that's sort of trying to act like a bar chart, but but what have we got? We've got these triangles instead of bars. Well, okay, so one thing, remember how we talked about the idea that if you're actually gonna try to encode something with height, well, then having something where you've got variable width is probably gonna be really confusing because of you know, variable area. This is even worse. It's not just variable area, it's variable volume. That is even worse perceptually than, than varying area. Um, you know, we can't really see what's going on with this one here because this other one here is in front of it. So there's somehow this idea of occlusion or of, you know, things being uh, blocked by other things. Um, you know, th there's a lot of other sort of very strange choices here about what do these numbers mean and why are they having the labels so strangely attached. But the one I really want to focus on for here is this idea that the three-dimensional shape is, is actually causing some pretty serious problems compared to what might be possible if this were just a simple 2D bar chart. What about here? We talked a lot about pie charts in 2D when we were talking about radial visualizations, but what on earth is going on? We have actually the same pie chart just extruded into 3D. And then at various, these are actually the same thing, duplicated five, six times for no apparent reason, but then they're tilted, right? They're not just three-dimensional looking, they're sort of tilted into the scene. So it's actually pretty hard to see, um, you know, make these careful judgments about angles that we're always thinking about making. So we don't seem to have a lot of high precision ability to see what's going on here. So let's let's try to analyze the situation with 3D and understand what the strong and the weak points are. Are so the first thing to remember is that when we were talking about position, that was planar spatial position. That's not a distinction I might have made super clearly at the time, uh, but let me come back to that. So this idea of position on a common scale or aligned position and, and unaligned position, those are specifically positioned in two-dimensional space. They're not positioned um, into the screen. In fact, position into the screen, that depth, that 3D position, is actually worse than a number of other things. It's, it's worse than area. Um, so, so that's one really important thing to notice. And so looking back, remember how in the Marks and Channels uh, lecture, we talked about this idea that the different sensory modalities had different exponents with that power law uh, for the psychophysical reaction to uh, sensory stimuli. And so remember length was great because it, you know that exponent was one, we see length very uh, uh, accurately and closely. And we see that the depth at 0.67 is even just a little bit worse than the area at 0.7. So it's further away from that 1.0 value that gives us accurate perception. Okay, so the thing to keep in mind is, um, you might think of yourself as a three-dimensional being, and you know, it's true, my hand is three-dimensional, right? I'm not flat. Um, but the idea of the danger of depth is actually getting at the concept that in some sense, you don't really live in 3D the way you might've thought you do. Think about the way we see that's actually just a tiny bit more than 2D. Let's call that like 2.05D to borrow a word from Colin Ware. Um, you might've sometimes heard of two and a half D, but we're, we're even smaller than that, 2.05D. So what do we mean by that? 
what we mean is that when we are acquiring information with our eyes, let's think about this, we look out into the world and there is an image plane on which we can actually see a lot of stuff, right? We can go left to right, we can go up and down. And so there's this whole plane in which we're seeing a lot of things. But, and we can, you know, see more even just by moving our eyes around, like, so we can move left, right, we can move up, down. But what if I want to see past something, right? So let's take, you know, this mug. If I want to see past this mug and there's something in the way, then I can't really see through it, right? I mean, it's opaque. So the only way for me to actually acquire more information about what's beyond that mug out in that direction is for me to actually move my head to sort of peek around it, right? Or I could move my whole body, right? So I could walk around, I could move my head. So acquiring information about depth into the scene actually does take longer. So the way to think about this is that while we can get really, you know, thousands of points up and down and left to right, along the ray from your eye to the first blocking object, you can only see one point. And then to get more, you have to go beyond that. So you can think of yourself as seeing an outside shell of the world. So what else is tricky about 3D? Well, one problem, so occlusion, that's the big word for stuff being in front of other stuff, right? Occlusion actually hides information. So it's possible if you have one thing blocking another, you can spin it around, right? Remember when we talked about navigation? Um, so it's possible to interactively navigate. So for example, here we see uh, an example of a three-dimensional graph. So we can resolve that by rotation, but remember that's going to take time and it's also going to take cognitive load because of that property where we are remembering what we uh, saw before and comparing that to what we see now. So anytime you resolve the three-dimensional shape of an object by spinning it around um, and seeing what's behind it, right, like if I had two three-dimensional objects, then, you know, yes, I can move this whole thing around, but it forces me to actually use memory. So you can resolve occlusion through interaction, but there is a cost. What else can go wrong? Well, perspective distortion. So things get smaller as they're further away from you. This is definitely true, uh, and it's probably been celebrated. If you've ever taken an art history class, you've probably class, you've probably talked about the idea, you know, that understanding how to get the mathematics of perspective distortion right or in a computer graphics class, right? That this is large when it's close to my eyes, but it's actually, and now it's large for you because it's closer to your camera. And then it's smaller as this moves away from the camera. Well, that's great if what you wanna do is mimic the semantics of the real world. But think about if you're encoding information by size, um, right? The dragons on this mug lid are much smaller to your eye than they are now when this is close to you. but if I were trying to visually encode information with that dragon, well, suddenly that visual encoding, I've lost the ability to just directly compare. And so that this idea of the power of the plane um, is just lost. Here's a very old uh, example, because no one's tried this lately, um, of visualizing the results of uh, a search engine. Um, and by having height coded little monoliths, right? These little three dimensional blocks, but then putting them so that they go off into the distance and they seem to get smaller and smaller, we can't make a direct comparison between the height of this object, say, and the height of that object back there because perspective distortion just completely obliterates our ability to do a perceptually direct size comparison. You know, we could maybe try to take into account that things getting smaller um, thing, but remember we want to exploit our perceptual system and we're unable to do that here in this case. So let's think about a, a classic case, 2D versus 3D bar charts. So I rarely say never in this class, but this is one of the few occasions where I'll say it's very, very hard to justify a 3D bar chart. Uh, it suffers from both of these problems. We've got the perspective distortion problem and the occlusion problem. So let's look at this example uh, due to Stephen Few. Um, it's almost always better to, instead of having a 3D chart like this, to have, say, multiple 2D charts. 
um, right? Because here we've got an example where we have the category axis and the department axis and then the money axis. And so, you know, and there seem to be these three rows, but notice how it's very hard to see what's going on with this red bar that's sort of hidden by the blue bar in front of it. That's the occlusion part. Notice how it's actually not so easy to tell the height of this green bar compared to the height of this red bar. Are they the same height? Are they different heights? Because of that perspective distortion with the things that are further away being a little smaller, it's actually pretty hard to make that perceptual judgment. Now let's compare down in this faceted uh, small multiples view where I've got one 2D chart for each of these rows in the 3D chart. And so let's see, we've got that uh, payroll for accounting. So that seems to be about this high. Uh, we can actually, of course, read off much more easily how high that is. It's a little hard to tell. It was maybe 22-ish here. I think we can more easily see yeah, it's 22 or 23. And then what about that R&D one where it's really quite hard to tell how tall that one is. Um, so, but looking at miscellaneous R&D, uh, then we can see, oh, that one's about 28. Okay, so we can actually just read off that one of these is taller than the other. That was much harder to do in the 3D scene. So it's almost be always better to, um, it, it's hard for me to imagine an example where it would not be better to use, you know, either just plain 2D or uh, faceted small multiples in 2D instead of a 3D bar chart. One more problem with 3D, it's actually because of the way uh, computers work, pretty hard to read text when it's tilted. Uh, so computers uh, have been carefully designed to have nice fonts so that when the text is exactly, you know, billboarded to the screen, seeing it right on, um, it's uh, carefully designed to be easy to read um, using some properties called things like anti-aliasing to make sure that the um, outlines of the font are very nicely done. Um, so as much as possible, it's really uh, crisp, easy to read, um, and we don't have this sort of pixelation. Uh, notice how we're seeing here, again, this is an older paper, but this phenomenon still exists, where as soon as we have these um, letters that are sort of tilted into the screen, they get really grainy and pixelated uh, and hard to see. So that's actually a, a, a pretty serious problem uh, with tilted text. Anytime you go off the image plane, suddenly things are going to get harder to read. Um, and so for any given resolution of a display, uh, you're gonna have a tougher time reading text. It can often be a little bit better than this at least, but it is a problem. Okay, so let's actually walk through an example of this. Um, so this is this example of time series data where what if you just had a curve? In this case, what we're seeing is the amount of uh, heat that's being used in a building um, from January 1st all the way to the end of December and then from you know midnight to midnight with time going that way. And then this vertical axis is uh, how many kilowatt hours are being used. And it's really hard to see a lot of things. We can see some things. We can definitely see that, you know, this is a very uh, norm oriented building where people are not there at night and then they come in, must be an office building during the day and then they go home. Can clearly see that. You know, we can see that the amount of energy used is less in the summer than in the winter from this, um, mostly from the color ramp, I would argue, not so much from directly reading off these values. Because notice how these are a little bit, right? They're tilted into the screen. Um, you know, we can see that both, and then for the max consumption, again, a little more in the winter, a little less in the summer. But if you have to compare like 1157 AM on February 3rd to, you know, 219 PM on October 8th, can you do that? I can't. You basically have no hope. You you don't have the kind of direct ability to just read off that position in 2D space because of, again, perspective distortion and occlusion. So you can't really make that perceptual judgment at all. So even though it's tempting to think that if 2D is good, 3D would be better, let's actually ponder, well, you know, is it really the best thing to just take that single time series curve, that line chart, and then just sort of extrude them all, you know, put them into 3D space. Maybe there's something smarter.
So with this example, where we transform to get a new data abstraction, um, what we see is that we have a, uh, using our idea about um, cluster hierarchies for aggregation. So we've derived a data set of a cluster hierarchy. We've taken all of those um, one dimensional curves. We have uh, created a uh, cluster hierarchy with them. And then we've taken the very top ranked clusters in that hierarchy and we visualize them in a way that's well known to be good for you know line charts. We're just doing them as two dimensional curves. Um, so we can actually make these nice precise uh, comparisons. Um, and because we're using multiple views, instead of simply using 3D, we're doing something more clever. We are um, using a linked color coding so that what we see here is the color of the line chart is reflected in the color on this calendar view, right? Calendars are very good for seeing temporal patterns. And then we're able to read off, well, what can we read off? So uh, remember from before, we're reading off, all right, here's a typical day in the winter, sort of maximum occupancy. Here is this day. Uh, well, we'll come back to this day in red. Here we've got the more maroon. That looks like a typical day in the summer. Here we've got green. This looks like summer Fridays and blue, which is days right around holidays. Pink, which is you know the day before New Year's, right around the holidays. Very few people have gone to work. And then there's that day right here, this bright red. This is the one day Santa Claus day where people get to go home one uh, hour early in the Dutch system. This is a, a Dutch paper where we're going from Monday through Friday and then Saturday and Sunday with these calendar views. So the reason we're coming back to this is to get this idea that there are alternatives. You often can think about more um, uh, derived data. Remember, we have these challenges for handling complexity. You could derive new data. You could interact with the existing data. You could fast across multiple views, as we saw in the previous example. Uh, you could reduce the amount of information shown, and we're here we're doing that with aggregation. So the combination of aggregation and multiple views here gives us a really good alternative to uh, just using 3D, where we can make those really precise things. And we can say, well, what for this whole cluster, which has this proxy here, you know, what is your value at, say, you know, I don't remember what I said, 11.59 versus 2.13. You know, we could actually check those things against each other because we are in a 2D space. So when do we want to use 3D? When we need to because there's an intrinsic attribute of the data that is spatial and in particular is 3D spatial. So if you have complex 3D structures and you need to understand their shape, then 3D is absolutely worth the costs because it has immense benefits. So here's a nice example from a uh, um, visualization of uh, flow data. So um, and with these sort of uh, flow examples, um, He's got this pretty complex shape. And really, the idea that you'd want to be able to just spin it around and see it, that can really, really help resolve the occlusion relationships. So yes, there is a cost to spinning it around and remembering. But where you really do need to understand the 3D structure, that cost is worth it. So spinning things around is an easy way to quickly get a synthesis across those multiple viewpoints. Um, Remember that you don't have to put data into 3D if it didn't start out as 3D spatial data. But if it did, then that's often a worthwhile use of 3D. Now I'll point out that there are some examples where uh, you could in fact justify the use of 3D. So I'm not saying never use 3D. I'm saying you need to justify it. Think it through carefully and justify it. So here's an example from the New York Times. Um, of a 3D view of a um, particular kind of economic chart called the yield curve. And what they do here, I want you to notice a few things. Uh, and uh, let's grab that one. Um, And let's flip so we're actually seeing. Uh, that screen. So um, 
So what have we got? We've got this uh, 3D view of a chart that predicts the future of the yield curve. So at the beginning, we see this particular view of the curve. And now notice what they do. We're going to, this is actually a, um, an example where we can do some navigation. And notice how when we go to the next view, they have changed the camera position with an animated transition so that now we're actually seeing it directly from the side. Um, and that really looks like a standard um, line graph. So we are seeing that line graph um, and we're able to sort of put into context uh, what this complex 3D shape looks like. Let's look at another one. Notice how, again, the camera has moved to carefully chosen viewpoints. We're not just doing free rotation. It's uh, chosen viewpoints. We're able to see uh, this close up here into what was going on with the economy in this um, little wrinkle that might be unnoticeable if you're further out, but actually is telling part of that story. Now, again, we've rotated. We're seeing something that's almost, but not quite, uh, from the other side. Uh, so we are able to capture some of this 3D structure. We keep going. Now, this is the one where we're just seeing it directly side on. So if we had seen it from one side. Now we're seeing it directly from the other. So what we see now is a line chart that's got these min-max bands on it um, that where we're not seeing that third dimension at all, uh, but we're able to really clearly see the, the two dimensions that are displayed. And now we're actually moving the camera again to look down from above. So it's looking essentially like a heat map. Uh, because we're not able to really see the up and downs, but we, given that this is redundantly coded with height and color, we are able to see that structure from above. And now this is actually showing us a different data set. Uh, we've moved from the US to Germany and we're seeing some examples of this negative yield situation. And now again, we're moving the camera and seeing the German data set from essentially the same point of view where we started on the US data set so that we could actually compare that memory to what we see now, uh, but at least it's a direct uh, same viewpoint. And then we're seeing yet a third uh, data set, again, from exactly the same viewpoint. So so that was an example of, it was not a intrinsically spatial data set, um, right? This was a choice about how to map that data set in space but it was a careful choice where the use of 3D was thought out. So in general, you wanna be very, very careful when you're using 3D. It is legitimate for true three-dimensional data, but you should justify it very, very carefully if your data set is one of these abstract non-spatial data sets. Um, so in the early 90s, there was quite a bit of enthusiasm. Uh, by now there's considerable skepticism for that. Um, and the really most dangerous cases are if you simply have point clouds, just points in three-dimensional space. That's one of the hardest kinds of data to resolve depth relationships with. Um, or if you have network data that's laid out as a node link network. Uh, here's a rather garish example from the late 90s. One of the last times something like that got published um, in a, a visualization uh, context. Um, and so notice how you've got some of the same problems that you've got these nodes that can be far off in space. Uh, it can be quite difficult to understand uh, the depth relationship um, in part because you don't have these continuous surfaces. So it's, it's much harder to see what's happening. So be careful. Uh, if you are using 3D, you need to justify why it's the right thing to do instead of simply um, making some careful use of 2D, maybe some derived data, maybe multiple views. So think about, you know, does the three-dimensional shape that you're showing them actually need to be understood by them to do their task? So along the same lines, if I'm encouraging you to be a little bit um, careful and thoughtful about 3D data, well, let's think about 2D data as well. So let's think about um, does a node link network, like we just talked about last time, does that require a two-dimensional spatial layout? Um, and we can think carefully about that. If you are actually trying to read text, say text labels inside the nodes, um, then it's always going to be harder to actually read text if you're laying out those nodes in two-dimensional space than if you just had them maybe in some simple lists. 
uh, where you would be making the most effective use of the white space. So you have to think, is it worth it? Is showing the topological structure actually worth the cost in pixels of the reduced information density of the ability to read text? So be particularly careful about thinking, is the topological structure of this network actually important for the problem I'm trying to solve? Remember that although often with network data, you need to understand its topological structure, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you only need to know an attribute at nodes, um, and you should be particularly careful when there's a lot of reading to be done in that data set. For example, search results or document collections or ontologies. One sec. So think about whether or not even 2D is justified when you have network data. Here's another principle, and we've alluded to this several times, but let's actually articulate this as a principle, which is eyes beat memory. And so the principle, we often want to compare external cognition with internal memory, and remember that internal memory is a finite resource. So it's always easier to compare when you move your eyes between side-by-side -side views compared to that uh, comparing what you see in front of your eyes to the memory of what you saw before. So I've mentioned this several times, but I really want to articulate this as an explicit principle. And there are these implications for animation. We've talked about some of the strengths and weaknesses of animation. Um, and a lot of people are very tempted to think that animation is just automatically great, right? You see Disney movies, they're wonderfully animated, you, you know, they're incredibly clear, you know, they're great storytelling. But those were created by a human choreographer who carefully made sure that your eye was only looking to one part of the scene at once. Lots and lots of tricks to make sure that animations are easy to understand, uh, and the masters of animation follow all of those tricks. But your data will not be so well behaved necessarily. Your data could have changes happening all over this frame, all over the screen, so you won't necessarily have that kind of choreography that you have in um, animation created by people to tell a story. So as we saw just in the previous example, animated transitions from one state to another can be great. But in general, animations where there could be things happening all over the screen could actually be quite hard to track. Um, and so often then small multiples is a good example. And so it's worth thinking about, you know, this idea of like animation versus small multiples. It's sometimes fruitful to think about that as something very literal, where if you have something that changes over time, you could show that by changing the view over time, um, as opposed to something more abstract, where if you've got temporal data, maybe you show those changes over time by putting them in different areas in space, as with small multiples. So these are the kinds of um, explicit trade-offs you can consider, where just because your data is temporal doesn't mean you necessarily want to animate it, because even though it might sound like time and space are things that you can interchange from just the point of view of the you know, semantics of the data, from the point of view of your perceptual system, they're very, 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 very different. So our ability to perceive space, uh, position in two-dimensional space is uh, a very different thing than our ability to remember what we saw in an animation that happened. So this example, uh, again, we want to think of if you've got these small multiples and you've got the color changing, so we're seeing this again just in the context of thinking about eyes beat memory, then although we could say we started in the first hour and they were the same and they're roughly the same in the second hour, and then in this experimental condition we see much more green on top and much less red on the bottom, and then in this last view we see roughly the same thing, we are able to get that gist with this diverging color scale, and we're just not able to get this gist here where we're just seeing you know this thing changing where we've got okay red yellow yellow orange red okay i think we're starting over again but but what about this one what about that one what about this one as all of these dots change we're really not able to follow this animation when there's disparate frames in disparate regions so one frame after another we can see pretty easily if only a, we have a small region to look at, that's not bad. And if a whole group is moving together, it's not bad. But this case where everything's changing at once is the bad case. And remember, this was only eight frames. People often try to do animations with hundreds of frames, or at least dozens of frames. And that can be very difficult to remember. 
So the animated transitions are the safe case, but in general, you want to be really careful when you think about should you be using eyes or memory. You often want to use eyes. So with change blindness, um, because essentially what's happening is if you're looking at one part of the screen and not attending to another part, even really, really drastic changes aren't noticeable. So uh, remember we looked at a few change blindness demos, and I just want to remind you of change blindness in the context of this kind of uh, situation where, in fact, I believe I'll need to, um, actually, I think I don't need to uh, run the audio. I will just speak over this directly. Um, when we see two images switching back and forth, and now we'll start that one over again. So when we have in a particular, any kind of a mask between them, uh, which is the, so if we're keeping our gaze fixed on the center and we're trying to notice, is anything different? You know, can we notice what's different? I've even seen this many times. Even I still can't spot that change because it's been just long enough that I've forgotten. Once our attention is drawn to the specific thing, right, like the trousers run by the man on the left, then even if you still look at the center, now that we know what to look at, I can see it. Even though I'm looking in the center, I could see that trouser change there because I'm attending to it. So one more. Let's see if we get that one. Again, keeping our gaze right in the center here. And again, I saw this only a few, I think a few months ago. Could we remember this? Now that they tell us where to look, car window on the right, even if we keep our gaze here, we're still probably not going to notice that. Right. So this is a little more subtle. It was a lot of glare versus a little bit of glare. So, all right, we we don't need to see all the change blindness demos. I'll leave that one back again for you to play with um, if you like. But, <clears throat> but the part I want you to be thinking about is that change blindness is a phenomenon that really is something you worry about in the context of animation and in the context of that eyes beat memory. So in particular, if you're remembering something, you're only going to remember the things that you attended to. And if there's too much change happening all over an image, you're not going to be able to attend to all of it. So you will be able to notice the things you attended to, but if there's too much happening at once, you can't attend to it all. Here's another principle. Resolution beats immersion. So um, these days, there's a lot of really nice new technology uh, around augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, but particularly for virtual reality, it can be tricky to uh, understand when is it actually useful to have abstract data um, in a, an immersive environment. One of the great benefits of immersion is you can often have a sense of presence, feeling like you're really in the world. Um, but for a lot of abstract data, you don't need that sense of presence. You don't actually need the ability to see stereo to resolve 3D depth. Um, another thing to consider is when it's actually going to be uh, an easy workflow. Often you're using a visualization not just in the visualization for a long period of time, but you're often switching back and forth between windows. You might be dealing with, you know, email, looking things up on the web, using the visualization, you know, maybe with a bunch of tools at once, that can be much easier to do on the desktop than in any kind of an immersive setting. So in general, remember how we talked about pixels are precious way back at the beginning, um, and we think a lot about information density, and we often worry about that. So often you have a trade-off where um, in order to get immersion, you often pay a cost by having fewer pixels available to you in terms of things like head-mounted displays and the actual available resolution. So usually in that trade-off, uh, we often want to go with um, getting the, the high resolution, um, dense pixels uh, when possible. Um, so far, I've found it hard to justify virtual reality for abstract data sets. Um, there is a little bit more promise for augmented reality, where you're actually seeing out into the world and having superimposed some sort of visualization that's um, in the context of what you see, 
that could be things like you know actually getting you know things like instructions for some uh, piece of equipment that you're repairing or something like that so there is some promise for that this is a very old example because again people hadn't done much with um immersive vr in a while although there are some people that are exploring it again these days so but for this kind of you know looking at things like bar charts and pie charts they they have a lot of the problems we had just talked about with 3d and even the ability to have stereoscopic vision where each eye sees a slightly different picture so that you are able to use stereo to resolve depth that's often still um, not as beneficial as simply avoiding 3d in the first place for abstract data again if you have true three-dimensional data then a lot of the benefits are worth it. Then a lot of the cases where you are going to benefit from seeing things in 3D, you may well benefit um, from the immersion. But um, be careful to think about whether that's in fact how you need to visually encode your data. Uh, another idea from Ben Schneiderman is this um, uh, so-called mantra of overview first, zoom and filter, and details on demand. Um, and uh, he actually repeats this line many, many times in a research paper, pointing out the number of times he's designed projects where that's been the right design idea. So this is certainly something to think about for your final projects, um, that if you have a big complex data set, or even a not so big data set, trying to give people an overview first so they can decide where would it be fruitful to navigate to, where the navigation is with the zoom and the filtering, uh, and then often to have some sort of a detail view where if you select some item, can you see it in more detail? So remember that the overview, that corresponds to a summary of the entire data set, and then maybe you navigate it around to get to the point where you look at either a smaller number of things or even simply one thing with the comparing and the querying uh, and the identity, uh, the identifying of a single object. So it's interesting about designing an overview, and we started talking about that recently in our um, lecture on aggregation, right? Because you can think of aggregation as a way to create an overview when you have even more objects than you can just see in a single screen. So you're often trying to create summaries through overviews. And that really is like the whole problem of visually encoding information, sort of a, a microcosm of that. Um, so this question of, but how do you create the overview? Well. That is the hard part. Another principle, uh, a rule of thumb here, um, is this idea of responsiveness. So when we talked about interaction, we alluded to this a bit, uh, but I was going to wait until today to really get into it in depth. So when you're trying to do you know, any kind of an interactive visualization where, say, you move the cursor and things change, well, you have to think about how soon do people need that visual feedback in order for this to work well. And there's roughly three categories of visual feedback, and this is some uh, work from places like Xerox PARC, um, a research lab uh, that did some of the really major innovation in uh, human-computer interaction and visualization in the early days. And so the rough categories are it's under a tenth of a second, and that is the speed at which we perceive, you know, we do a lot of perceptual processing, right, like actually seeing things, recognizing things around us in the environment. So in that context, um, we have, uh, if it's under a tenth of a second, like a sub-second response, that's great. Like something like, you know, when you're moving the mouse around and you want to quickly have that sort of mouse over highlighting of, as we've seen, um, that's a reasonable response time. Now, the next category is if it's about a second, right? So if things happen in under, a, you know, roughly a second, um, that feels like it's, immediate. It feels like cause and effect, where when you click, you know, and then the button changes color, showing that you've clicked, that's the kind of responsiveness you want. Things involving the cursor where instead of just moving things around, you know, very, very quickly like I'm doing here, if I actually have to go from one spot like control to motion and back, that actually takes longer because I have to get to that target. In HCI, there's a principle known as Fitz law that has to do with how long it will actually take you um, to, you know, how far are you moving and how precisely do you have to get uh, the mouse on the way back will give you uh, an ability to calculate how long that will take. So that kind of things involving physical motor control of moving things, about a second is good. Now the other interesting category you want to think about is what it feels like for something to be brief, right? Like let's say you click OK and then a little bit of computation happens. You know, most of the you were willing to wait a bit, but 
if it's going to be quite a long time, um, right, like if you, you know, if it says, you know, searching or crunching or something like that, you know, if it's a few seconds, you're willing to wait. If it's like six minutes, you know, that's going to just feel like incredibly long, right? You don't just want to sit there and stare at it and wait for minutes at a time. Um, and so we think about, you know, anytime you've got something that you think has any possibility of taking longer uh, than several seconds, then you probably want to actually have some visual depiction of what's going on so the user doesn't just wonder what happened. Did you even understand that I clicked the mouse? Um, you know, so that's something like, you know, loading a large file, something like that. So what you want to think about with these three categories are, depending on what you're trying to achieve, you have to think about whether it's realistic. And this is one reason why we think so much about the scale of data sets, so scalability. So for example, if you've got a selection and you want to just be able to highlight what's under the mouse, and you, what if you have a big complex scene, instead of redrawing every single item in that screen in order to tr change the color of the one that you picked, maybe you only have to redraw the one. For those of you who had a graphics class, this is like doing front buffer rendering uh, in a graphics context. Or if something is going to take multiple seconds, maybe you should actually show some sort of visual indication, like an hourglass, that computation is happening. Um, and if it's going to be, you know, quite long, then it's particularly nice if you give them the opportunity to either cancel or undo that operation instead of just being stuck. Um, if you've got something that's going to take a long time, maybe you should be smart uh, about your systems programming and actually use multiple threads where if you had a background thread that the process was happening in, then you could still allow interactive responsiveness to the rest of the UI, um, even if that computation is happening in the background. Um, and then if you have a lot of items, you're going to actually have to think about the issues of rendering them fast enough so that, for example, if you're moving the mouse and you want the view to update as you navigate, you maybe you think about some sort of a guaranteed frame rate. Um, that level of uh, rendering concern is beyond the scope of this class. Uh, but I just want you to be aware of it uh, in case you run into something like that in the future. Um, and then, for example, at some point, once you get to um, really large data sets, you might not just use sort of raw D3 with SVG as we've been doing in this class, but you might use uh, frameworks like Canvas or uh, others to actually get responsive uh, frame rates. And finally, let's think about this idea. You might have heard of the saying, uh, um, of form and function, right? You might have heard, you know, uh, form over function. Um, but I actually think that uh, a good motto for visualization context is function first, form next. The idea here being that they both do matter, um, but it matters if something is, you know, visually aesthetic, and it also matters if it's actually functional. And one of the emphases of this class is that we really are worried about whether a visualization isn't just pretty, but whether it's functional. And the reason you start with function is if you've got something functional, you can improve the aesthetics by refining what you've done. Um, and maybe, you know, especially if you're out in industry after you graduate uh, and you're working on a team, you might be able to find someone who's trained uh, in graphic design, which we have not been emphasizing in this class. It's important, we just haven't had enough time to teach it. So even if you're not personally uh, able to do it um, or nobody on your team is, maybe you're going to be able to outsource to a graphic designer who can help you refine something functional into something aesthetically pleasing. So aesthetics do matter. Um, you know, people are much more willing to interact with the visualization for a long time if there's some level of visual elegance or beauty. Um, and so there are some principles of, you know, some basics of uh, graphic design and layout. Um, we're not actually uh, covering these in detail in the class, um, but those of you who've taken a psychology class, uh, one uh, relevant thing is the Gestalt principles. Um, and, uh, but the reason I'm emphasizing function first and form next is the other way doesn't work. If you do form first and make something pretty, and then you worry about function, you can hit a brick wall because you can't just add function. You could take something pretty that's not useful and you're just stuck. You, you can't typically turn pretty things into useful things, but you can often improve useful things to make them a bit more visually elegant. So even though this is not the, fun 
um, main focus of this class, I am just going to give you a quick walkthrough of some very, very basic ideas out of graphic design. And uh, we're going to take some examples from the Non-Designers Design Book by Robin Williams. So here's an example of, you know, and this is actually not even with visualization. This is just simply text layout. So one thing you can notice here is we aren't actually using grouping. You know, similar things are not being grouped together. And so this sort of makes everything look like they're roughly all the same importance and we don't really see any groups. Whereas notice how here where the main title is together, the subtitle is together, and then there's a lot of space between that and the author and date, it actually gives your eyes the ability to sort of notice these groups and group and when these things are grouped together, again, by your perceptual system, uh, not at a conscious level, you're much more able to sort of quickly and easily actually read this and it looks better. It looks better because it's using white space more intelligently with proximity. There's also the idea of alignment, that actually having things that are aligned rather than making your eye move back and forth as you say, go down the screen, um, actually can be a lot easier. So a lot of you might start out using centering automatically, but sometimes it can be easier whether it's left justified or right justified for your eye to actually follow a, a line like that. So that's the principle of alignment. Um, if things are uh, similar, then having them actually be visually consistent uh, can make a big difference. Um, so notice how we've now got, in this case, it was a similar font, uh, but in our case, we might think about things like being consistent with, you know, color coding. We always want to use that consistently. And then finally, this idea of contrast. And what they mean by that is if things aren't absolutely identical, i.e. consistent, then they should be really different. They shouldn't be like almost the same, but not quite. Uh, that is the kind of thing that is much worse. Uh, so here was where there was actually just visually, you know, noting those two uses of the word around um, and actually having this, you know, strong contrast between the black and the white. But basically the principle is either have it be exactly the same and consistent or very different, but not just sort of kind of there. That's the most distracting. So if you are intrigued by this and don't have any background in graphic design, a really great resource that's really, really easy to read um, and just use is this Non-Designers Design book by Robin Williams. Um, so I highly recommend that. And then finally, with this idea, uh, while we're thinking about rules of thumb, I do want to remind you again that making your visualization self-documenting is good. You should always label things like titles. Uh, you should have titles for things, you should label your axes, you should have legends. Um, you often want to have labels for both sort of sub windows. Um, you know, think about your tick marks. Um, you know, when do you actually need to have titles on your legend or um, on axes? You know, always think about like your numbers, things like, you know, 10 E, you know, to the minus seven um, is perhaps much less easy to read than something like, you know, 10 M for 10 million. Um, if I got my numbers there right. Um, and of course, I do love this XKCD, as I love many of them, for making the point that labeling your axes is crucial for life as we know it. So uh, just to summarize, some of these ideas we'd seen at different points in the class, but I wanted to present them all together. We've got no unjust unjustified 3D, where we remember that uh, 2D spatial position is the really uh, high accuracy perception, whereas 3D depth is much harder to perceive. Occlusion hides information. Perspective distortion makes it much harder to actually do any sort of direct size comparison, and tilted text is hard to read. We talked about no unjustified two dimensions as it pertains to network layouts. The idea of resolution over immersion and as it pertains to any kind of virtual or augmented reality or immersive displays. This concept of first having an overview and then going into navigating in with details on demand. We've seen a lot about that with the multiple views with these overview detail views. Um, responsiveness is something you should consider as a designer who's doing uh, systems questions of, you know, how long does something take to compute? And then finally, this idea of function first and form next, not vice versa. All right, so this was from uh, chapter six of the book, and I do recommend the Robin Williams book. All right.